Let me make sure we're all on the same page. Of course we are, but just to confirm it. Space, it's a $300 billion industry worldwide. NASA is actually a tiny percent of that. Interesting how small a percent NASA is to the total world spending of space. That little bit, however, is what inspires dreams. Every corporation in here with representatives to this conference, if you ever even touched a science mission, you lead off with that in your, in your quarterly reports, in your annual reports. Because it inspires, it is the act of discovery that empowers nations and the world to undertake these activities. We know this. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. As best as I can judge, people outside of the space community view the space community by and large as a special interest group. Special interest. And in, in the following way, all right, so monies get distributed to districts, so representatives fight for those monies so they can have the jobs in their district. How much fighting do other representatives do for NASA or for space industry? if they don't have space industry or a NASA center in their district. Hardly at all. Hardly at all. So NASA is actually lucky that it's got 10 centers scattered across eight states. It's lucky. It's not clear how, how what NASA's survival factor would have been over the decades if it didn't have that breadth of representation. Not only that, those states in which it's represented typically flip back and forth between Republican and Democrat. Typically. Or if you look at the balance, if they don't flip, you look at the total balance between the parties among those eight states, it's about 50-50 over the years. So there is even part, partisan balance to the support for NASA when it's there. But nonetheless, it's by and large thought of as special interest. And here's what's interesting, I think. There's space tapped heavily in the service of the military. There's space tapped heavily in the service of weather satellites, communication. But you know something? If you do your job perfectly, it's the kind of job where nobody notices. If we are protected by a web of space-borne military satellites and we are not attacked, that gets unnoticed. We're driving down the road, running our GPS, it is working, we find our destination. Nobody's thinking about satellites. They're just thinking, did they get to their destination in time? It's like shaving. No one will come up to you and say, hey, you shaved real good today. The act of doing it perfectly is the measure of it going unnoticed mowing your lawn. You can mow your lawn perfectly. That means no one's going to notice it. So there's a hidden dimension to the role that space plays in our culture. That when it's done perfectly, it goes unnoticed. Or at best, is just taken for granted. All right. I, I have more evidence of this. I recently delivered a testimony the Senate, the Subcommittee on Commerce, Transportation, and Science. It was about NASA, really about space and our ambitions. That committee has two dozen senators. Three showed up. That's, that's in my expectations. I don't, I'm not, that's not a complaint that I'm lodging here. It's an observation I'm sharing with you. Okay? Who are those three senators? Senators with important NASA properties in their states. We had representation from Texas, representation from Florida, the two big ones right there. Sorry, headquarters. 
We got Kennedy and Johnson. They're there. Senator from New Mexico, try, I think, trying to make sure New Mexico doesn't miss out on something that could be happening in the future of space. That was it. To me, that's a measure of the fact that the Senate thinks of space as special interest. Because only those senators that had direct interest in their states were there for the hearing. And I kept thinking to myself, really, that's not who I should be speaking to. I want to speak to what you guys stay home. Bring me everybody else who doesn't understand what the role of this epic adventure is. I was hoping C-SPAN would be there to film it. They were not. So I said, you mean this testimony is just going to get deposited in the congressional record? And, and But there was a camera there, and it in fact was filmed, and it, somebody posted it on YouTube. It's there. It's there. Fortunately, it is reaching the people for whom the Senate, Congress, and the President work. Okay? President works for us. Congress works for us. So when people say, oh, do you want access to a senator so you can try to convince him or her of some, I, I, wanna, I want access to the people. In a democracy, that's supposed to matter. And however delusional I might be, I still think it does matter. A little bit more about this special interest bit. We all remember the exact instant. You might even remember where you were in your life when Newt Gingrich said he wants to put moon colonies <laughs> on the moon. <laughs> He's in Florida. He says, I want moon colonies. Okay, by the way, that ambition is not as ambitious as Kennedy in 1961 saying, let's walk on the moon. We didn't yet have a vehicle that wouldn't kill an astronaut for being launched. So I found it curious that certain sectors criticized Gingrich for wanting a moon colony. In fact, there was a partisan divide because I got interviewed when he made that statement. So I analyzed it. I said, Moon Colony, it's all right. I think his, his plan to enable that needs some work. I might have chosen different words for that, but I, his plan could use some, but basically he's trying to jumpstart our space ambitions. The liberal press reported on my commentary by saying Tyson shoots down Gingrich's moon proposal. The conservative press reported on the same words that I had spoken, reported Tyson sympathetic with Gingrich's moon proposal. So there's a lens that has split, a partisan lens, split into two parts that in my judgment and from my view is interfering with the consensus that needs to be driven to make real decisions happen. So that's actually not what I came here to talk to you about. I just wanted to just put us all on the same page. I want to talk about space, not as spin-offs, not as industry, not as weather saddle. No, no. I want to talk to you about space as culture. Space as culture. You know, the first hunk of hardware that had the power to exit Earth's atmosphere? That was the V-2 rocket, of course. Everybody knew Werner von Braun all the way down. Everybody knew that if we have any future in space, it's going to have to borrow some of that technology, if not all of it. The 1950s descends upon us. You remember the V-2 rocket? It was kind of bullet-shaped had these huge fins. Fins. Cars had fins in the 1950s. Where do you think those fins came from? All right, I propose the experiment. You, you, if you, you could probably dig up the designers of those cars and they'll say, well, fins just kind of look cool. They're probably not even thinking 
about the fins of the V2 rocket. They're probably not even thinking about it, all right? And if it's there, maybe it's just not in their frontal lobe. But our cars had fins. When did the fins go away? After we learned that the V2 shape and those fins, that's not quite the rocket we're gonna need to get to the moon. Our rockets start looking like the Saturn V rather than the V2. By the way, that V2 rocket shape, that, if that, that was the rocket in every science fiction story told in the 1950s. Just go back, rent any movie on Netflix from that era, their rockets got fins. I have two books, Bob Barr Goes to the Moon and Tintin Goes to the Moon. They're in rockets with fins. I collect stuff like that. Saturn V emerges. The fins go away. What happened to those fins on the Bel Air and on a, the, the 57 Chevrolet? They're all gone. Oh, so maybe the designer just felt, oh, it's played itself out. Or maybe deep down inside, space was operating on their creativity. So what happens? The 60s are underway. We're going to the moon in a big way. Everybody knows it. We are innovating. We have an innovative culture. You know it's an innovative culture because every week, every month, a new advance in space garners the headlines. Because a space frontier is being breached. A space frontier. And when you breach a space frontier, there's something new to talk about in that day's paper. Something new to talk about. Every next Gemini mission more ambitious than the previous one. Typically redoing what did before and then it went a little extra, a little farther, a little extra docking maneuver. We're ready to transition out of Gemini to Apollo. Let's, do, let's launch the Apollo rocket, minus one of the stages. Now let's put it in all three stages. Let's actually go to the moon. Don't land yet, because we, we're still working that. Well, when was that? That was 1968. I'll get back to that in a minute. What else was going on in the 60s? Everybody was dreaming about tomorrow. Everybody. That's what the World's Fair was all about. It wasn't about yesterday. It wasn't about today. It was about tomorrow. The kind of tomorrow that could only be brought into the present by the ingenuity of scientists and engineers. And people knew this. How else is space influencing? Okay, how about the Unisphere? Gorgeous, steel Earth sitting there. It's got three rings around it. Okay, go to the designer and they'll say, well, I just put on the rings. Well, did the three orbits of John Glenn influence? Oh, well, I don't know, I don't think so. But it's got three rings, not two, not four, and the rings are not going polar, they're going equatorial. Hmm, three rings around an earth. 1964, New York World's Fair. The 1960s is the bloodiest decade in American history since the Civil War, since the 1860s. Servicemen killed weekly reported in the weekly papers. Campus unrest, civil rights movement playing out in the weekly news. That's the 1960s. The bloodiest year in that bloodiest decade? 1968, the Tet Offensive in February of that year. Martin Luther King assassinated, RFK assassinated. Yet, somehow we managed to still dream about tomorrow. It was still in us. It still mattered. It's what birthed the Star Trek television series. In my, by my measure, one of the greatest television shows ever, The Twilight Zone, was heavily influenced by space themes. 
Every third episode, there's some space concept being delivered to you, telling another story through the lens of a space story. Our presence in space is affecting not only the engineers and the mathematicians and the scientists, it's affecting the creative dimension of that which we call culture. We are living it at every turn. Hardly what I call a special interest. What happens in December 1968? How do you cap off that year? Apollo 8. An underappreciated Apollo mission, not by this audience, but by anybody else. Most people never heard of it. Apollo 8, what's that? Excuse me, that was the first time anybody ever left Earth. With a destination in mind. Yeah, it figurated around the moon. Photo of Earth rising over the lunar landscape. The photo is really misnamed because the moon is tidally locked to Earth. So Earth is always in the sky, on the near side of the moon, always. So it only was rising because, in fact, they were figure-eating around the moon and Earth rose up. That photo, we all know it. Earth rise over the moon. There was Earth, seen not as the map maker would have you identify it. No, the countries were not color coded with boundaries. It was seen as nature intended it to be viewed. Oceans, land, clouds. We went to the moon and we discovered Earth. I claim we discovered Earth for the first time. How does that affect culture? I got a list. You could, you could take apart this list and come up with an explanation that does not directly reference space for everything on this list. You could probably do that. But I take a step back and I look at that list and I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, how is it? Let's back up to 1962 briefly. Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. The Green Movement typically credits that as the birth of ecology, the birth of caring about the environment. It was a best-selling book. I have a different view. Maybe it planted some seeds, maybe it tilled the landscape, but stuff didn't really start happening until after that photo of Earth Rise Over the Moon was published. 1968, the whole Earth catalog is published. There's a version before that photo is printed. The instant that photo comes out, that is the identifying cover picture of the whole Earth catalog. Thinking about Earth, as a whole, not as a place where nations war, as a whole. Seven months later, 1969, we land on the moon. 1970, we're still going to the moon. We go until 1972, so watch this sequence of events. 1970, the Comprehensive Clean Air Act is passed. There were two other versions of that in the 60s, 1963 and 67, but the most important rendering of that act came in 1970. Earth Day was birthed March 1970. The Environmental Protection Agency was founded in 1970. There was a film called The Hellstrom Chronicle it was one of the first documentary, pseudo documentaries to actually get first run in the theaters. It was all about insects, kind of, it was a scare movie about insects and what role they might play on our food supply as we go forward. But it got us thinking about nature. The organization Doctors Without Borders was founded in 1971. Where do you even get that phrase from? 
No one thought of that phrase before that photo was published. Because every globe in your classroom has countries painted on it. Doctors Without Borders, 1971. DDT gets banned, not right after Rachel Carson's book, gets banned in 1972. We're still going to the moon. We're still looking back to Earth. Clean Water Act, 1971, 1972, Endangered Species Act. Two versions of that in the 1960s. The, the most comprehensive version, 1973. The catalytic converter gets put in in 1973. Unleaded gas, 1973. We're still at war in Vietnam. There's still campus unrest. Yet we found the time to start thinking about Earth. That is space operating on our culture and you cannot even put a price on that. That is, that is a nation, that is a world reacting to a new perspective on what it is to be alive on this planet that we all share. And out of that era, an entire generation of people, they think, they feel, they intellectualize about space. We see it in the art. We see it in Hollywood. We see it in television productions. Storytellers. That's because the space frontier was crossed weekly. You know, back then, you didn't need special programs to convince people that science was a good thing in school. You didn't need special programs to show people that engineering and math, the STEM fields, that these are useful to society, to our identity as a nation. Because the headlines that were writ large over that era had built into them the fact that innovation created those headlines. Innovation brought to you by an ambitious community of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. So what happens, mid-1970s come. It all ends. By the way, I have a collection of magazines, Look, Life, Time, even Collier's going back into the 1950s. They all talked about tomorrow. How many, how many issues did you have to wait to before there was an article about the city of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow? It was in our culture, it was in our mindset, it was in our zeitgeist. 1970s come around. That all ended. The space frontier stopped being breached. We did other things. By the way, there was an engineering frontier that we took on. How do you make a reusable spacecraft? How do you build something in zero G? Something big, like a space station. All this comes in the next 10 to 20 years. That's advancing an engineering frontier. It's not advancing a space frontier. And if I may put some of this in perspective, remember that schoolroom globe I was telling you about? Take Earth, shrink it to a schoolroom globe and ask, how far away is Mars on that scale? It's a mile away. How far away is the moon? 30 feet away. Most people get that distance wrong because in textbooks, they have to fit the moon on the same page as the earth. So you think moon is much closer than it actually is. We've been lied to over all those years. If you drew earth as a natural three inch size circle on a textbook page, the moon would have to be several pages back from that. You need a fold out to check it out. Mars is a mile away, the moon 30 feet away. The International Space Station Space Shuttle orbiting Earth three-eighths of an inch above its surface. That's not advancing a space frontier. Some other kind of front, not space frontier, I assert. By the way, the thickness of Earth's atmosphere on that scale, it's the thickness of the lacquer on the globe. That's how thin this air is that we breathe, that we think of as an ocean of air. It is as thin to the earth as the skin of an apple is to an apple, as the lacquer is to a schoolroom globe. 
So you got to love the space entrepreneurs who are taking tourists up above the atmosphere. But we're kind of telling them that that's space. And I, I look at Earth and I come to it as an astrophysicist and I see the rest of the cosmos and I say, you got some more work to do on that one. Okay, keep at it, guys. All right, so what are the current problems here in America? Not other parts of the world. Here in America, what are, our economy is in the toilet. Hardly anybody's interested in the STEM fields. Our jobs are going overseas and you have politicians that are pretty sure they have a solution to that. Oh, you need more science kids in the school? Let's make better science teachers. Man, there's a band-aid for you. Put that right there. Throw a couple of dollars on that one. That ought to fix that. How about our jobs going overseas? Okay, let me think about that. All right, how about put in some tariffs and make some tax incentives in the community? We'll keep the factory right there. Another band-aid. People aren't innovating. So we have to, so we put money in sort of innovation businesses. Okay. These are all band-aids, people. They're band-aids. Here's what we got to do. And I've said this a billion times. You double NASA's budget. Right now it's a half a penny on a dollar. Half a penny. That pays for everything. Space station, space, you know, every, this astron all, this, all the centers, the Hubble telescope, the James Webb, the, 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 the rover, the, the Kepler, everybody is out of that half a penny. You double it. Double it to a penny. That's all I'm going to say. Double it. And here's what you do. I'm a little unorthodox in this vision statement. I'm not going to twist people's arms. Let me just put it out there. I don't want to be driven by one destination or another. I don't want to say our next thing we're going to do is space. We're going to go to Mars. It's like, excuse me, how about all the rest of space? You know what I want to do when you double the budget? Let's create a suite of launch vehicles. We're kind of sort of doing that now, but let's do that as the focus. A suite of launch vehicles with strap-ons, whatever you need, one configuration will get you to the moon. Another will get you to a Lagrangian point. Another will get you to Mars. Another will get you to the Earth-Sun L, uh, L2, another Lagrangian point. Maybe there's an asteroid headed our way. We want to do something about that. We got another special configuration of rockets that'll get us there. So we create a suite of vehicles that gives us access to space. When Eisenhower came back from Europe after he saw the Autobahn and how it, 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 it survived he heavy climactic variation and troop man maneuvers, he said, I want some of those in my country. All right, so he gets everyone to agree to build the interstate system. Did he say, you know, I just want to build it from New York to LA because that's where you should go. No, the, no, the interstate system connects everybody in whatever way you want. That's how you grow a system. And I'm not going to discriminate. If there's a military reason to do something on the moon, we got the launch vehicles to do it. If there's a tourist reason to go to the backside of the moon, we'll, that's another configuration. You want to mine the moon? We, that's another one. Scientists want to study, see if there's life on Mars? We'll do that too. Everybody's space interest gets served by this capacity. And when you do this, you guarantee that you are advancing a space frontier every week. And you, I can guarantee you every week there's going to be a new headline. Astronauts, engineers found a way to extract the water from the soils of Mars, separate the hydrogen and oxygen. We now have a supply of rocket fuel on Mars, a fill-in station, so you don't have to carry all your fuel with you. We've, we're mining helium-3 on the lunar surface. I don't know if it's cheap enough to bring it back here to Earth, set up some other nuclear reactor somewhere else in space. Whatever are the needs or urges, be they geopolitical, military, economic, space becomes that frontier. And you know, you know, 
every week some new invention is going to be uh, granted. Some new patent is going to be offered. Because space is hard, space is dangerous, space is exciting. Not only do you innovate, these innovations make headlines and those headlines work their way down the educational pipeline and everybody in school knows about it. You don't have to set up a program to convince people that being an engineer is cool. They'll know it just by the cultural presence of those activities. You do that, it'll jumpstart our dreams. That's what it'll do. And you know innovation drives economies. It's especially been true since the Industrial Revolution. You double nest as much. It's not a handout. That's what it is today. That's what everyone thinks it is. It's a handout for special interest. You know what Mitt Romney got wrong when he criticized Newt Gingrich for pandering to Florida, the Florida constituency, by saying he'll do all these nice things for NASA? Ronnie said, you're just pandering to, to, to Florida. If you go to, you go to New Hampshire, you'll tell them something else about some bridge that they want. There's a deep misunderstanding there. The very statement that talking about NASA is pandering omits, omits the fact that NASA drives our economy. The culture of NASA drives the culture of innovation and it's the culture of innovation that drives the economies of the 21st century. That's what it's missing. Even if there's pork spending on NASA, even if there's pork, what comes out of that spending benefits the nation in ways that a power plant or a bridge or a local road does not. I'm just, I can be honest about that. Even if some of you can't, because you're in it, you're too close, you got, I can say it, and I'm saying it. And you know what happens? The jobs do not go overseas. You don't have to set up tax benefits. They don't go overseas because we're innovating and haven't figured out how to do it yet. It has to stay here in America. And you have to keep innovating. They'll eventually catch up, fine, hand it to them. You can't simultaneously assert that we are a global economy and then cry foul if a corporation takes a plant overseas where the labor's cheaper. That's kind of part of how that works. So the solution is not trying to just prevent that with laws. You innovate so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Teacher training? We need that. It is a necessary but insufficient condition to make this happen. You can have an awesome teacher in middle school, high school. Now you want to become a scientist. You come out the other end of that educational pipeline. What do you do? We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers or lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s because there's no place for them to take their interest in science. You have big, bold, ambitious projects. You get them all, especially since the NASA science portfolio involves biologists. We're looking for life. It's got chemists, geologists, astrophysicists, physicists. The NASA portfolio touches all of these. Not only that, we need the electrical engineers, the mechanical engineers, the structural engineers. NASA is a one agency showdown. If we have an innovation culture, we'll resurrect some of that attitude we all had in the 1960s. Except this time it'll be without the tandem expensive war that was conducted. By the way, if China wants to put military bases on Mars, we're on Mars in 10 months. You know that, okay? <laughs> they just have to leak that memo. It doesn't even have to be true. We'll take one month to fund, design, and build the craft in nine months to get to Mars. We'll be on Mars in 10 months. We already understand our resolve when we feel threatened. That aspect will remain. That capacity to react will remain. The difference is we need to look at NASA not as a handout, but as an investment. Because I can tell you that as 
the health as goes the health of spacefaring ambitions so too goes the spiritual the emotional the intellectual the creative and the economic ambitions of a nation so goes the future of America. What do you think space advocates can do better to effectively communicate with elected officials who are already not in favor of space activity? Thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, I spent many years grappling with that very point. What I came to learn is that the space, com by the way, I forgive what sounds like a cheap plug, but recently I published a book titled Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. The original title of that book, submitted to the publisher, which they nixed, claiming it was too depressing. The original title was Failure to Launch the Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. Here's what everybody's doing wrong. They think that non-space people will feel exactly the way we do about space. We, as we, we assume that they, they're gonna look up and, oh, that's, I wanna do that, oh, that's great. Oh, it's in our DNA. Oh, we are explorers, we are American. There's a whole list of arguments given. Do it for the spin-offs, and we do. Oh, wait, every dollar in space is spent here on Earth. These arguments are tired. Not only are they tired, they work for us. But if you wanna step out of this community, you need a different kind of argument. You need to compel the nation to value space exploration on a level so deep that it transcends the winds of political discourse. In just the same way, veterans' benefits is not on the table in a presidential debate because we mandate that that's important. You don't even debate that. So you get into the culture, the value of what it is to explore, not only psycho-emotionally, but economically, because there's a percentage of the public that doesn't care about the psycho-emotion. They care that they have a healthy economy. It's the economy, stupid. That's the phrase. And so the transition is NASA as a handout to NASA as an investment. And when you think of it as an investment, it's cheap. You do it. Because the discoveries of NASA will lead that exercise in just the same way as I earlier asserted in your annual reports. You lead with your space missions because you know it's cool. Plus typically they're not classified, so you get to talk about it <laughs> on the cover. So, so what do you do? I, I'd like to believe that I've assembled some messages that have leaked out of our, our community and have resonated with others. The opening chapter of that book was excerpted for Foreign Affairs Magazine. I don't know how many scientists ever got something in Foreign Affairs Magazine. That got into Foreign Affairs Magazine. And for, I would later learn, because I'd never even read Foreign Affairs Magazine, that I have nothing against it, it's just not my journal, right? I would later learn that that lands in the lap of every member of Congress, and it was two days after that landed in their lap that I got the invitation to testify in front of the Senate. Had it only been the book, that invitation surely would not have come. It's just another space book, as far as that would be concerned. So, the geopolitical implications, the, the economic implications, got me interviews on, like, on, on, on business, business news. Because we're, we're in a doldrum in our economy, people are looking for anything that could help. And so my suggestion is you talk about ways that space matters to people who actually don't care about space. Then it becomes deeper into people's motives. And the economy is number one by far. And, the, and, and you get there, it, by the way, it's not just A goes to B. The A goes to B is need better kids, get better science teachers. That's A to B thinking. Some solutions take a few steps. A to B to C to D. 
You double NASA's budget, you innovate, you, there's a call for all the scientists and engineers and technologists. They then become these fields. Patents are awarded, industries are created, the economy booms. That takes a little longer than an elevator ride to explain. Not from New York, our elevator rides are a little longer. I could do that in a New York elevator ride, not in Rayburn office building, okay? So yes, it's a challenge. But if we don't rise to it, we will regress back into the cave because that's where we're headed as the rest of the world passes us by. It is not sufficient to write the check. And so Columbus was an explorer. Queen Isabella, no. She wrote the check. By the way, there were some private monies mixed in with those public monies, but basically it was a mission of the state. Columbus was an explorer, but when Queen Isabella said, Columbus, Queen Isabella didn't say, oh Columbus, go explore and come back and tell us all the things that you found and draw pictures of the flowers and of the natives there and, and give lectures on, on these discoveries. No, she said, here's a satchel full of flags of Spain. Wherever you land, declare the land in the name of Spain, find a shorter route to the Far East so that we can trade more efficiently. There were geopolitical and economic drivers behind that, even if, even though Columbus himself was an explorer. I submit to you that we can talk exploration as a pure urge forever. But at the end of the day, the checks get written for different reasons. And the history of the world bears that out persistently. Next question. Are you planning on taking a trip on a suborbital flight in the near future? Uh, I'd rather it went somewhere other than, here's my issue with suborbital. I'm not gonna get in the way, like I said, you gotta love them, have, have them keep at it, okay? But I have an issue with that 100 kilometer definition, right? That 62 mile, you're in space definition. My issue, it's just a, it's a, it's a professional issue, it's not a cultural one. It's, and we know why that, that elevation matters, because there's, the atmosphere is so thin above you, there's still some molecules there, but it's so thin, you can see stars in broad daylight with, with the sun in the sky, okay? So the sky, the, the atmosphere is not lighting up your night sky. It is night at all times, okay? I, I, I understand that. But what it means is that the altitude where we define you for having gone into space is a function of the thickness of our atmosphere. If our atmosphere were half as thick, that number would be 50 miles. I mean, sorry, it would be 30 miles. If it was half that thickness, it'd be 15 miles. If we didn't have an atmosphere at all, you could just stand there and say you were in space. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of argument is that? So, so I, I, have, I have issues. For me, orbit. That's a nice, for me, that's where I draw the line. And orbit is really different from suborbital, all right? There's kinetic energy going on there where coming back is an issue. Whereas if you go suborbital, you can just put out your wings and coast back down to Earth. This is something that's not always captured accurately, by the way. In the Star Trek film, where they had that drilling station where they're gonna insert the, the red matter to make the planet a black hole, don't ask. Uh, so there's a platform there hovering above the planet and there's a fight that they're having on the platform and one person gets punched off of the platform and you see him fall and what happens as he comes in contact with the atmosphere he burns up it's like no no just the act of coming through the atmosphere doesn't burn you up it's 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 the speed that matters the orbital speed five miles per second going to zero, that energy's gotta go somewhere. That's gotta go somewhere. That's a whole other, you know, all other challenge of space exploration. This is going suborbital. So maybe I'm gonna save my money and wait for the first orbital tourist flight. I'll be first in line for that. Okay, so that's a no. That's a no. <laughs> How important is national pride for the success of space programs? I think we tell ourselves it's important. And occasionally we tell ourselves it's not important that cooperation matters. Of course, cooperation does matter. 
The International Space Station is the greatest expression of international cooperation outside of the waging of war that there ever was. So there's a lot to be said for cooperation. I didn't have an issue, I had some issues, but not as many issues as others had with our astronauts taking Soyuz to station because they're partners. And so we, they, we did that during the downtime after Columbia. So, so I, I don't fear collaboration. I, I don't have an issue with that. Typically collaboration is invoked when we say it's expensive so we need some funding partners. I'm saying if it's an investment, the partner becomes an investor, not someone else who simply shares the cost of the mission. So all the conversation about international cooperation gets supplanted by who's got the money to invest. And when you do that, by the way, the government has to come first. The government, the space frontier, but I'm gonna answer a question you haven't asked yet. I don't know if it's there, but I get it asked all the time. Will space entrepreneurs lead the frontier in space in, rather than NASA? The answer is no, that cannot happen. It will not happen because space is expensive, it is dangerous, the risks are unquantified. You put all three of those together, you can't say, okay, who's in? It doesn't work that way. There's no business model for a corporation to do something expensive with uncertain risks where you might die. Governments have historically taken on those first steps. When the government does it, as Spain did with Columbus, then the maps are drawn. The trade winds are established. You learn that there aren't demons at the edge of the earth that will eat your ships. You bring these back. Then the investors take a look at it and say, I can now quantify the cost of this. You took the, the nation burden, took the risk, the initial risk, I will now take the quantifiable risk and now I get my venture capitalists to make this happen. So the history of it is that they come in afterwards, not up front. And that's kind of what's going on now with private enterprise trying to gain access to low earth orbit. In the 1960s, low earth orbit was a frontier for the nation. It is not a frontier anymore. So sure, let private enterprise have at it. Provided NASA still gets to go someplace beyond. Otherwise, we're just closing shop. Because we need, we need that percent, that ambitious percent. Like I said, that part that you put on the cover of your annual report. So obviously in these times of fiscal challenges, do you see a way to tweak what we have now uh, in terms of budgets, space program, to have something as inspirational as I think uh, you're talking about and alluding to with your... I'm not even going there. What you're telling me is, okay, if I were head of NASA and I get the crumbs that the nation handed me, how would I spend it to prioritize and make an exciting program? No, it's the wrong question. That's, that's asking for handouts. That's, that's just trying to make NASA this vanity project for engineers. That's the wrong attitude. It's the wrong understanding of its actual role in our society. So, I don't want to lead anything. I want to convince the public that the right NASA budget will get us out of these economic doldrums because at the end of the day, it's not what the president feels like or what Congress feels like, it's what we feel like doing because the president works for us. Where can I realistically expect us to be in the next uh, 40 years? Next 40 years, if we double the budget, we're everywhere. We're on asteroids, we're on Mars, we're on Phobos and Deimos, we have sample returns, we're on the near side of the moon, the far side of the moon, which is in a radio shadow from Earth. Earth is radio noisy for conducting sensitive scientific measurements. We would stop that asteroid headed our way. That's kind of an important thing to do as well. All right, military has whatever their needs are. We have tourist jaunts to the moon. We're doing all of this. And we'd be doing that within a couple of decades. A couple of decades. That's why I was frustrated. I was at the Obama speech in Kennedy Space Center, April 15th, where he said, 
Moon, we've been there, done that, let's go to Mars. Sound, it played well in the audience. Because it's right, we've been to the moon. All right, but then I thought about it and I said, wait a minute. Okay, that means we're not going anywhere until we go to Mars. So what is that gap? Oh, it's 20 years. 20 years? Wait, so stop the presses. You mean, Mr. President, you are committing this nation to go to Mars under the leadership of a president to be named later on a budget not yet established? That's not a promise. Anybody could have gone up there and promised that. I didn't even have to be president. When Kennedy in 1961 said, we're gonna put a man on the moon before the decade is out, he's thinking we're gonna land on the moon basically under his watch. So he can marshal the political will and all of the forces that were present in 1962 through that decade and the budget tracking that that required. So I'm worried that we're dependent on what a president wants to do. That was my earlier point that going into space should not be about what the president wants to do. It shouldn't be about the whims of Congress. It should be about the electorate and how the electorate feels about this and the future of our country. Uh, this is something I think you, you talk about. Uh, I find that young people are excited about STEM careers, but their parents are often not, blocking these dreams for their kids. What's the answer? Yeah, because kids are, are born scientists. They're always turning over rocks and plucking petals off of flowers. They're always doing things that by and large are destructive. And uh, <laughs> that's what exploration kind of is. If you you take stuff apart, whether or not you know how to put it back together. This is what kids do. A, an adult scientist is a kid who never grew up. That's what an adult scientist does. So what happens at home is the kid reaches in the refrigerator, pulls out an egg and starts juggling it. What's the first thing you do as a parent? Stop playing with the egg, it could break put it back. Excuse me, this is an experiment in the material strength of... <laughs> Let the kid find out that when it drops, it breaks. That's, that's, this, this is a physics experiment. Rapidly turned into a biology experiment, okay? The yolk oozes out, you say, hey, that becomes a chicky one day, okay? Wait, how does this gooey oak become a chicken? Well, that's biology, check that out. And what did the egg cost you, the 20 cents? President of Harvard once said, if you think education is expensive, you should try the cost of ignorance. So we don't have enough parents who understand or know how to value the inquisitive nature of their own kids because they want to keep order in their household. Kids go in into the kitchen and pull out all the pots and pans and start banging on them. What's the first thing you say as a parent? Stop making all that noise. Stop the racket. You're getting the pots and pans dirty. You just squashed an entire experiment in acoustics. So, I'm not worried about kids. People say, what can I do to get my kids interested in science? They're already interested in science. You're the one who's the problem. So, almost my entire professional energy is focused on adults because they outnumber kids. They vote, they run the world, they wield opportunities. Kids will be fine. What do you see uh, in terms of the countries involved, private, public, um, the crew makeup of the first uh, human mission to Mars? We have built into our culture this concept of the right stuff. I think it's a great bit of iconography of that era. I, uh, we milked it quite well, I think, and. Uh, heroes are made out of this. I think that first crew, whatever it numbers, by the way, people worried about boredom and things? No, no, have you ever seen kids play with video games? Just give them like 10 video games, they'll play for four years, you know. Because if they're adults who never grew up, they'll be happy with the video, they play Angry Birds the whole time. Um, give them a Netflix account, they'll be fine the whole way, all right? Uh, I'm not worried about boredom of astronauts going to Mars. So, so I think that first class is a special class. They're doing what no one has done before, 
you want you don't this is not a lottery you, you want people who you want to emulate you want people who did well in school you want people who ate healthy you want people who are moral you want people who who can become that next generation of heroes because if they make it to Mars and even if they don't there are heroes there are heroes in life and in death so who is that astronaut class now I think they're in middle school maybe we should start now select the middle school group of kids who would serve as the astronaut class in 20 years for the first Mars mission we select them newspapers will write about them what's little Johnny eating today what's he having for breakfast they'll be on Wheaties boxes the next astronaut class oh well one of them reached puberty and it didn't quite work out not on the list anymore okay had other hormonal priorities that replaced his math homework okay <laughs> little Johnny got kicked off of that list we have we it'll be the next Mercury 7 I I think it's a it's a hard choice but we know how to pick the, the, the best and the brightest and the strongest the, we've been doing that since the beginning of time and not everyone is gonna want to do it as I said in one of the clips not everybody wants to leave the cave fortunately some of us do and not all of them come back but whether or not they come back we build statues to them to heroes that's another dimension of the culture that so many of us take for granted that was rampant in our society that transformed how we understood the world in the 1960s and early 1970s and I see no reason why that cannot be resurrected once again.